Thank you, choir. Thank you, Greg, for your effort. Big Al, it's tough when you're the only guy in the choir, isn't it? <laughs> and you're running the sound. Guys, do you hear that? We need some more men in that choir, so please come on Wednesday nights and sing with the choir. They're preparing for a Christmas cantata, is what the practice is about. And so you can see we need to grow in number to pull off the cantata. So men especially, we need you in the choir, so please support that ministry with the gift God has given you. Uh, Greg specifically asked me not to show up on Wednesday nights, just to preach on Sunday. We find ourselves today getting into the Word of God in the Gospel of Mark, the 10th chapter. Continuing on from the story we heard last week with James and John, we have a new perspective this week. Uh, a, a scripture that is rich, rich in relationship with Jesus. And it's the story of the blind Bartimaeus as he receives his sight. It's the 10th chapter, the 46th verse through the 50. Second verse, hear these words. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him, but they told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped. And he said, Call him. So they called the blind man. Cheer up. On your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, Jesus said. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus along the road. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Ever equipping God as I speak, may you increase. And I decrease. May the words you have given me for this message be seeds that rest in my in our hearts that we might bear fruit for you here on earth. May I be bold and courageous in speaking what it is you've given me to speak. And may we as your people have ears that hear. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Beggars. You ever see one? Saw one yesterday. What are they always holding? Signs, right? Beggars. They don't shout anymore. They just hold a sign so you can say, see me. So you can pay attention. See me. That's what their signs say. See me. See me. See me. See me. I saw one one time in um, Trinidad, Colorado. It was the most unique, honest sign I've ever seen. I, to be honest, I just want a beer. I gave the man five dollars. <laughs> but today we find Jesus with his crowd of people. His disciples are walking with him. Those who are curious, those who are, are there for the show, those who are on the fringes. That they're with Jesus. And they're walking from Jericho. And as they're leaving Jericho by the road, by the side of the road. Because you know that's where we put beggars, isn't it? Isn't that where we put beggars? Have you ever seen the beggar standing in the middle of the room? <clears throat> They're always standing on the side of the room. Because we as society put them there. Because we say, mm, what do you have to offer? Just go stand over here. If you'll wait over there, they'll try to help you. If you'll stand over there, if you'll stand on this corner, if you'll go to this place, and we push them to the side of the road. And the crowd walked by him. How many people do you think had walked by that beggar? Many, many, many people. Many people. And you know, he, he couldn't see, but people can hear. Those who are in beggar condition, those who are on the fringes, those who are pushed out, those who, that power and prestige that we talked about last week with James and John, those, those people we push. Because we need to be seen, because we need to be heard, because we need to have power, because we need control. Those people we've pushed, 
they can still hear it. They hear what we say. They hear the words. And Bartimaeus was no different. He was used to people walking by. His entertainment for the day was listening. He was smart. He was thinking, you know, who, who could help me? Who could help me? And he hears somebody say these words. Come on, it's Jesus. Let's go. Hey, that's Jesus of Nazareth. Let's follow Jesus. And Bartimaeus jumped at the opportunity. He used the one instrument that God had given him to reach out to Jesus. To cry out because he needed help. Because he had been placed. And so he used what God had given him in a voice. And he shouted out in a way that he wanted triumphant victory. Listen to what he said. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now when he addressed Jesus, he didn't address Jesus like you and I do. Because he's not post-resurrection. He's pre-resurrection. And he's crying out, Jesus, son of David. That's a power title in his time. Son of David was, was, was a military title. That was like you were going to come and overthrow. You were going to ride into Rome in a victory and overthrow everything. That, that's the title they used for emperors and people who were going to come in and, and have authority. Son of David. Son of the great one. You're going to ride in for victory. You're going to come and you're going to trample all those people who oppress us. <laughs> Son of David. So he, he approached him from an authoritative figure, a powerful figure. He cries out to Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And, and what do we as the church say to beggars that do that? Anybody know? We do this. Shh. Pastor's back in his office. Could you come back at a later time? Uh, if you'll go stand over in that line, maybe somebody will help you. Shh, just be quiet, okay? Don't, don't distract. That's Jesus. Don't. We're doing holy work here. You need to be quiet. And we, or we see them standing there with their son. We drive right by. We drive, we don't even see them. We subconsciously see them, but we purposely don't see them because what happens if we roll down our window and we say, hey, can I help you? They're crying out to us all over the world. We're crying out. We're still stuck in our positions of power and prestige, and just like James and John. And have we encountered the fullness of the Christ? And the beggar cries out. He's not giving up. They tell him to be quiet. He's like, I don't think so. This is my one chance in life to encounter Jesus, and I'm going to holler at him until I get his attention. Do we do that? You ever holler at God? You ever yell loud enough that you need God to get your attention because you're in desperate needs? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David. And the people say, shh. And Jesus tell him, call him. Call him. Have you ever, 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 ever read a text where Jesus rebuked somebody and said, don't come near me? Call him. Jesus has ears. Jesus heard what was going on. Jesus was in the middle of the crowd like he always is. Jesus is in the crowd. He's probably leading the way and everybody's following behind him. He sees the baby. He hears the cry of the beggar's heart. And he knows. This is the most beautiful thing about this text. He knows. He knows what the beggar needs just like he knows what you and I need. But the beggar's willing to cry out. He doesn't care what people think about it. He's not like James and John asking for power and prestige and position. He's crying out. Have mercy on me. That's all he wants. That's all he wants is have mercy. And Jesus says to his people, the church, call him. Reach out to those who are in need of mercy and bring them to me. Church, enable your body and get it together and let's go out and find people who are in need of Jesus and bring them to Jesus. Let's do the work the church is supposed to do, whether we're the beggar on the street or we're the James and John seeking power and prestige and, and prophets or whatever we're seeking. Let's be the people of the church and let's go and bring those who are need mercy to Jesus. Call him. Bring him here. And here's what he did. I love this text. It's so rich. 
He threw off his cloak. I mean, I can see him. He's there like this, right? The crowd pushed him way to the side. He's huddled up. You've seen him. I see him under underpasses. I see him on street corners. I see him at the church door. I see him in my office. I see him everywhere I go. People we push to the fringe. And I see him sitting on the pews on Sunday morning. Their cloaks are disguised in sports coats and nice dresses. And they're begging. Begging for God to have mercy. Begging for God to touch their heart. Move their mind. Begging to be called out by God. And what does he do? He throws his cloak and he jumps up. He's blind. Do you remember that he's blind? He throws his cloak and he jumps up and comes to Jesus. You want to think about that one for a second? The man's blind. Now, would you just throw your cloak off and jump up and come down here to the front with your eyes closed? We're not going to do that because we might bump into a few. We might trip. We might run over somebody. We might fall. And God knows we don't need to fall. This man was so desperate to encounter the Christ that he was willing to risk his own body. He was willing to risk everything he knew. He threw off his cloak and he jumped up and he came to Jesus. Do you hear what I'm saying? He sacrificed all about who he is, all his prestige, all his power, all his personality, all his, everything, all his image, everything. Because he asked God to have mercy on him and God said, now's your time. Now's your time. God said to him, come on. Call him, bring him to him. And the crowd said, he's calling you. He said, I'm coming. He ripped his robe off and he jumped up and he ran to Jesus, a blind man who can't see where he's going, who can't see the crowd. He goes through the crowd and he comes to Jesus. Are we doing that? Are we that passionate about our relationship with Jesus that we don't care what's in our way? Are we too worried about walking a straight line or bumping into a pew or hurting somebody's feelings because we believe in Jesus? And God's calling us into an encounter, but we're afraid to go because somebody might not think we're cool. It might not have the right level of power or prestige. It might not have the level of control that we want. We might have to give up something of ourselves because God's calling us. He didn't own anything. He threw it to the wayside when he jumped up. And he ran to Jesus. God's moving in your heart. Church, God wants you to be engaged. God wants you to be embraced. God wants you because what happens next is the greatest story of love you'll ever hear. God called to him and said, come on, come on, come on, come on, I hear you, come on, I hear you, come on, I hear your prayers at night, come on, I hear you during the day, come on, I know about your family, come on, I know about your kids, come on, I know about your job, come on, I know about your marriage and how hard it is, come on. And God wants us to jump. God wants us to lay aside anything that's keeping us from God. And to blindly walk in faith to the Christ. To blindly walk in faith to the Christ. Do you know what that means? You set your sights on Jesus and nothing else. You don't care about what it looks like. You don't care about what the power is. You don't care about what the prestige is. You don't care what level of society is. You don't care what other people think about it. You don't care... You just want to be made new. You just want to be formed again. You just want to be able to see. Don't you want to see with the eyes of God? Don't you want to be able to see human beings as they are? Where you can look into their eyes and you can see that they're made from God. And that it doesn't matter where they live, what they do, or who they are, or what they say. But they're God's kids. They're God's creation. You just want to see. That's all you want that's all he wanted was to see. And now comes the most wonderful thing that Jesus does. He made his way to Jesus. There's an old saying that I work a lot in the Emmaus movement. And it offers me an opportunity to be intimate with people spiritually. Because a lot of people come in here and they won't open up. Because the structure, the rules, the but often a campsite away where they're not around any of their friends or any of their family or any influence out, they'll tell you the true story. And you can sit down and you can talk to them. 
And you can represent Christ in the situation and you get to see. You get to see him. They get to see you. And Jesus, he gets to Jesus. And the most important thing is, you know, we tell people, you can take them to the cross. I can lead you right down here, put you on your knees, right before the cross. But I can't do your work. That's what I tell them. I can't do your work. I can intercede for you. I can pray for you. I can lead you to the cross. But I cannot do your work. The work of the beggar can only be done by the beggar. You hear me? To have your prayers answered, you have to come do the work. You have to allow intimacy with the one who created you. Those walls you have in your heart, those blinders you have on your eyes, those plugs you put in your ears, you have to remove them. You have to want them removed. You have to be able to come to the cross and do the work. It doesn't matter if you cry. It doesn't matter if you lay on the floor and wail. It doesn't matter because God wants you in the intimate grasp of his hands. Jesus didn't yell at the beggar on the side and say, Hey, see you, brother, you're healed. Did he? he said, Come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Come on. Come, come to me. And he threw off his cloak and he ran to him. And he did this. Mm. He saw him. He saw him. Jesus saw the beggar eye to eye. And he said this. This is the greatest thing Jesus ever did. He asked this question. It's the question he asked us. Every day, every minute of our lives. What do you want? James and John told Jesus what they wanted. Prestige, power, the right and the left. And all that stuff we talked about last week. Jesus calls the beggar to him. With a repentant heart, have mercy. There's nothing for him to repent about. He was born blind. And he just wants mercy. And God says, I see you. I know you. Why did Jesus have to ask him what he wanted? Don't you think God knows what he wanted? Don't you think God knows what's in your heart? God knows my heartache. God knows my struggles. God knows what, what I fight in everyday life. But if I'm not a person of faith enough to speak to God and talk to God about what I need. It's a one-sided relationship. That's why Jesus wanted Bartimaeus to talk to him. He wanted him to talk to him because he wanted him to say, Jesus, I need this from you. All of you know who are married or have relationships, you know the, the first thing that breaks down when a marriage goes to the pits is communication. When marriage becomes two people living on their own sides, it doesn't work. It will not work. But when two people come to each other with open hearts and they become one, why do you think the scripture says they become one? Because God wants us to be one. And if God created marriage in God's image for two human beings to come together and be one, then the spirit of God wants them to be one. We want to be one with Jesus so we can be one with the Father. One with the Spirit. Come and sit and talk to me. Come and sit and talk to me. Tell me what Jesus says. What do you want? That means he cares. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? You've got the opportunity to talk to Jesus every day of your life, every minute of your day, if you'll just talk to him. And be honest with him. Don't play the game. Give him your heart. That's what he wanted from Bartimaeus. And you know what Bartimaeus said? I want to see. I want to see. What was the one thing Bartimaeus was like? He could walk. He could talk. He could hear. He could function with his arms. But society pushed him away. Why? Because he couldn't see. So what Bartimaeus said to Jesus was, I want to be whole. 
I want to be whole. I want to be whole. Do you hear that? Lord, that wounding that's in my heart, would you take it away? That deceit, that, that time I've been betrayed, that time I've been lied to, that time. Would you take that and let me forgive those people and not let that burden me? That time that I was the victim, Lord, would you just forgive those people? Lord, would you help me move past that? God, I want to be whole. That's what Bartimaeus said. I want to be whole. I want to be whole. And when he said that, he used a term that you need to hear. I hope you picked it up when he said it. He went from saying, Jesus, son of David, to this beautiful word, Rabbi. Do you see the move that Mark used? From this authoritative son of David figure to this intimate Rabbi, teacher. One who I am learning from, one who I'm engaging with, one who is on a personal level with me. Bartimaeus shifted, his whole spirit shifted. He wasn't crying out for authoritative power, he was crying out for intimacy. He was crying out for wholeness. How many of us cry out for wholeness in our lives? And we go to God, and we go to God, and we go to God, but we don't really give ourselves to God. One of my brothers that I meet with weekly. He and I were on the phone together and he said, you know, I probably don't always communicate with God. I'm jealous of you. Because I don't get to intimately communicate with God like you do in certain situations. What I said to him was, you just have to start. There's no glorious words. There's no perfect script. You just have to give God your heart. In that situation, give God your heart. Rabbi, I'm here to learn everything from you, is what Bartimaeus said. My faith is in you. Do we talk to Jesus like that? Are we disciples enough of Christ that we give our hearts to God? That we take every pain we're harboring, every prejudice we're harboring, every time we see someone holding us up, Do we offer ourselves to God? Or do we stay superficial with God? Because you see, there's one thing that made Bartimaeus well. When Bartimaeus answered the question to Jesus, Bartimaeus believed. Bartimaeus believed that Jesus could provide the answer. He believed that Jesus could provide the answer to, to what he's going to ask for. What do you want? What do you want? What does it take in your spirit to be intimate with the Christ? What do you want? Do you want to be healed from an addiction? Do you need to humble yourself so your marriage will be in a better place? Do you want to work in a place that brings out the joy of your heart? Do you want your children? What is it you want? But you have to be intimate with the Christ enough to be honest. And to believe that if you give it over to God, God will give it back to you. Do you believe that strongly? Do you believe that strongly or are you still like James and John? And you're going to say, hey God, my marriage is suffering. I'm going to give it to you, but I'll be dang if I want to change anything. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hand. Isn't that how we handle God? That's not how Bartimaeus handled God. He had his one encounter with the Christ. And he jumped at it. And he ran to Jesus. And Jesus says, what do you want? Jesus cares enough. You know the Spirit's in you, right? When you reform the Ruah of God filled you. The Spirit's in you. You just have to recognize that Spirit and say yes to it. And when you say yes to it, then Jesus can say, what do you want? Son. Is that term? Any of you who have children, you know what that feels like to say that, right? My daughter. Hmm. No, there's nothing in the world I wouldn't do for my children. And everyone who's a parent, I know you feel it. Jesus says, 
my son, your faith because you believe. Not because you believe hard enough. Not because you have perfect Sunday school attention. Not because you've never missed worship. Not because you're an elder in the church. Not because you're a preacher. Not because of... You just believe. You have faith in the Christ to know that you are God. And you are God's beloved. And God cares about what you want. And God wants you to be what? God wants you to be whole. God wants to take all that junk that's keeping you away from that relationship and wash it down the river. And God wants you to be whole. My son, get up. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. Your trust in God has healed you. You now walk with freedom of sight. You are whole again. And immediately it says, I love that. God took that request and said, Bam. Immediately Bartimaeus could see again. Can you imagine? He jumped at the opportunity to encounter the Christ. Can you imagine what he did when he all of a sudden opened his eyes and he could see? When he can see the reality of what your shirt really looks like, what 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 the person looks like that sounds like that, what what a tree looks like, what desert, all the stuff. His mind had to be just blowing from what he could see, and he was well and he was whole. Don't you know he jumped and ran around and just absorbed everything he could because God moved in his life. How many of us live in a faith like that? That God moves in our life and we don't care what anybody says about us. We don't care what people think about us because we've been healed by the mighty God who made us whole. We've been healed by the one who was resurrected on the third day and who sits in glory. We've been healed by the God who calls to us and says, come to me, come to me, come to me. I want to know what you want. And then says to us, you are healed. For Bartimaeus, and a lot of other people I know, that encounter was life-changing. He had been made whole. And he could walk wherever he wanted. He didn't need somebody to hold his arm and guide him. He didn't need a stick to walk with. He didn't need a dog who could tell him where he was. He could walk freely amongst the people. He could do whatever he wanted to do. And he could go wherever he wanted to go. And he could see whoever he wanted to see. And he could embrace the world in all his fullness. And he made one decision. He followed Jesus down the road. You see that? He had all the temptation of the world in his eyes. All the beauty that God could put before him. Everything he's ever wondered about. It had been answered. Everything he had ever dreamed about. Everything he had ever visioned. He could see in his eyes. And he had the decision. He had the right. He had the authority to walk and go and do whatever he could see. And in his wholeness. He followed Jesus down the road. He followed his teacher down the road. He followed his healer down the road. And he is one with the Christ. Are we sitting and begging? Or have we answered the question that Jesus asked of us? What do you want? And we've been healed and are willing to follow Jesus down the road. Amen and amen.